Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. All right, guys. Hey, welcome back. Welcome back and uh, happy Tuesday. Uh, here in New York, it's raining a little bit. I uh, hope you guys are being safe out there. And uh, if you're driving in your car right now, don't go too fast. I don't like when people go fast when it's raining. So just be careful about that. Guys, I got a great guest coming up here. Um, Mary D., uh, she is the founder at the Mad Love Agency. And uh, the website is maryd.com. And um, she's got a great topic for today. It's uh, what she does is, is, you know what? Let me, let me, let me get Mary D up. Mary, uh, welcome to the show. And I think you do a 10 times better job than me describing what the Mad Love Agency is. And by the way, so nice to see you. And thank you for being here. Absolutely. Great to see you as well, Casey. Yeah. So, you know, Mad Love Agency at the end of the day, it, it's, it is the agency that I founded and it's, it's, I'm passionate about the work that I do there. We go in and we help busy professionals who want to be effective leaders in their organizations, create a culture of fun, productivity, uh, because you can have the best of both worlds. So many organizations are really struggling right now with balancing out performance with leadership. Their cultures are really wonky. Some people have gone back to work. Some people are working from home. You're they're all trying over to the figure place, out. Right? Yeah, they're all over the place right now. So uh, at the end of the day, I want people to love their work and feel like they are showing up on purpose and both are possible. And oh. so I love to bring, call out the impossible and make it possible. Awesome, Mary. So now the people, uh, will you deal with like uh, the head of sales or will you deal with the CEO or uh, department heads? Uh, who, who is your prime uh, candidate? Absolutely. It's usually a CEO. So it's a CEO that's looking at his organization and, and recognizing that he has some gaps in leadership and gaps in culture. And so they are typically the ones that are going to tap me and say, hey, I need a conversation with you. And they're usually going to bring their COO along because that operations person is typically that leadership person who has a lot of say over what's happening in the organization and really has the pulse of what's going on there. And then if they don't have that person in place, then, of course, that's a whole different conversation we like to have with them, which is how do we help you get that right person? Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, Mary, where did you uh, learn leadership from? I, I, I assume the first form of leadership is uh is your your, your parents right. uh, did they instill that in you at first and then tell me where where uh some people impressed uh leadership uh, on you and you saw what it really was mm, that's a great question yes for sure my parents my mom was very entrepreneurial at the same time she had a job so my mom was one of those women who had a job but she also had a side hustle and her <laughs> entrepreneurship a hundred percent shone through through all of that you know because my mom is also this was her first time in America. So she had to navigate a lot of things around like paying taxes, even mowing the lawn. I mean, there, there are things that you just have to like end up teaching your parents when you're in that position versus when you, you know, grow up overseas. So it's, it's a whole new lesson and also being an American. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and as that kind of first generation here for her, having, you know, my Thai heritage, but also growing up as an American kid, I got to be that bridge for her. So it created a lot of learning for me too, of things that you just need to know. Right. And I learned those really early on because I'm really trying to help my parents be an adult in the world, but I'm still a young child, but I have, you know, the language and the education. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So you, you learned, you, you learned it uh, um, by, by watching it, but also you had to actually teach too when, when you were a kid. Oh, that's, so, that's so interesting. So it's a per perfect storm for success in what you do. So yeah, sure. I, I, yeah. Okay, I get it. I get it now. Yeah. And I had great mentors too, Casey. And that's why the foundation of the work that I do here is around mentorship, leading, um, really leaning in and helping with that teaching piece. Because number one, I've been teaching for a long time. And then number two, it was so valuable for me. I had people who were where I wanted to be in business, really invest in me when I was young. And it gave me such an edge. It gave, it gave me experience that I would have had to go out into the world and spend years learning. Now I have the benefit now, of course, that I have over 20 years of experience now, yeah. but at the time still, they gave me so many nuggets and so many just juicy gems of real world frameworks and real world experiences that I could draw from 
right? And so when we don't have someone else's, our own experience to draw from, we can take someone else's experience and say, wow, how can I apply that to this situation and use it to my benefit? And also, how do I embrace making mistakes and making them quickly so that they can be lessons so that I can now make better decisions moving forward? And that's where this gives us an opportunity to do that in the mentorship setting, in a mastermind setting. We get to talk to each other. And when you're in operations, I miss that. Like, I didn't know that there were a lot of great organizations that I could go and join where I could meet other operators because we're a different, we're a different crew, you know, like you have a lot of marketing groups out there. You have a lot of advertising groups, but you don't have a ton of operations, project minded kind of really dive in in this space that we're in come to the table and let's share our best practices there's there's so much to go around and i think that's important for people to know like we don't have to hoard our genius we should be sharing it for the benefit Mm -hmm. of everyone i love that that's a great line right there um you speak so well i mean uh do you do motivational speaking at all Oh, thank you yeah i have definitely been a keynote speaker my whole life as well i I know it Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's such a big part. You know, Casey, I love connecting with people and I just really am a fan of sharing. And that's all I would tell people that are like nervous or they have a story to share. I'm like, get up on stages in life, whatever that is, a conference call, whether it's your work, whether it's your kitchen table (laughs) and share your experiences. And if you do it from the heart of sharing, it's never going to come out wrong. Yeah. That's all, Mary, that, uh, it, it's so cool to hear you say that because I see such a passion that, that you have and uh, it, it all, the, at the bottom of it, it's just, it's helping other people get to uh, a certain place. And it's so cool to see. Uh, and I'm glad Thank that uh, we're actually, we're on uh, Zoom right now. People listening in their cars or whatever, but we're on Zoom right now. So you can actually see it in her face when she talks about this. She, uh, it's, it's like speaking about her child or something like that. This is, you're, you're so into it. I am. I am. I love this. I really do. And that's why I said you can you can show up and live in your passion and your purpose and enjoy the work that you're doing in the world. And that's what I want to help other people do. Awesome. Hey, uh, Mary D, uh, we got to take a short break, right, Mr. Producer? Yeah. Oh, we, we do. Yes. OK. Um, uh, I, we got to take a short break, Mary. When I come back, uh, I'm going to get to uh, Diane, Phyllis, Jacob, uh, all you guys from uh, last week or the other week when uh, I didn't get to you. We said we were going to, right? And Mary, Mary wanted uh, to definitely address those. She didn't want anybody to feel that they weren't being uh, answered. So Mary, let me take this quick break and we'll be right back, okay? You got it. There are 7.7 billion people on earth today. 40% of these people are under the age of 25. Young adults are the most fertile mission field in the world today. In scripture, we see Jesus pouring his life into 12 young adults who he equipped to change the world and all of history. Like Jesus, we believe that the best approach to reach the world with the gospel is to invest in young emerging leaders and equip them to build disciple-making movements. Concentric is the notion of surrounding and sharing a common center. Our center is the model and strategy of Jesus for both leadership development and ministry formation. As a global alliance, we provide equipping in biblical leadership based on Jesus' example in the New Testament. Jesus modeled for us how to make disciples that reproduce. Focusing on leadership development is key to creating movements that spread the gospel and Jesus' disciple-making strategy to young leaders around the globe. Our Ministry Alliance partners are actively equipping leaders and building movements of multiplication that reproduce the life of Christ. Join us today to equip young leaders with Jesus' strategy that will change cities and nations. The session that we had with BCAT was really entertaining and enlightening. We were able to put together some very specific steps that we as individuals can take and it was really fun to all come together and see sort of where we're going as a team and how we can all get there together. We had a tremendous experience with the BCAP partners. One of the challenges that we have as an organization is to make sure that we have the right people in the right chairs doing the right thing. To do that well, you have to have synergy. 
you can try to dream up ways to make sure that your group does that or you can rely on experts. We would recommend BCAP Partners to anybody who's looking to take their organization to the next level. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. All right, guys. Hey, we're back. We're back right here with my special guest, Mary D. Mary, welcome back to the program. Thanks, Casey. Hey, Mary. So I have uh, some of the old uh, instant feedbacks that people uh, wrote the last time. Yeah. The producer says that he's got one that just uh, came in right now. So I, let's let's do the first one there. And then we'll Absolutely. Let's tackle them all. I want everyone to feel seen and heard. Let's do this. I love that about you. That's so cool, Mary. Awesome. So we have uh, Freddie from Memphis. Uh, his question says, um, COVID has made nearly everything virtual. Do you offer, teach uh, leadership courses to people that are trying to lead others virtually? A hundred percent. I've actually been leading virtual teams for over 20 years. Uh, one of my very first businesses that I was launched into from entrepreneurship was a virtual business. And then we ended up opening an office. So we had a hybrid model. So I'm very familiar with that. Um, even in my big banking experience before that, when virtual wasn't like trendy or cool or post COVID, uh, <laughs> it was actually something that we did at the bank as well. Cause I had multiple off, you know, I had, I had buildings in other States and people there who needed needed my leadership. And so that's what we did. And I'd fly around and make that happen, but we also did a lot virtually. So super familiar with it. And I actually think it's a really beautiful model because you get the best talent that way. You get your local talent that you might need for your local area, but you also can reach out into the world and grab some amazing talent that just might not live in your neighborhood, but can still serve your business in such a beautiful way. Well, I never thought of it that way, Mary. I mean, uh, by the way, for, for that, uh, uh, what was the person's name? Um, who is it? Freddie. Hey, Freddie, uh, go to Mary D. Uh, it's Mary D E E dot com. Uh, go on there and um, check out the website. But Mary, I never thought of it that way where, you know, I, of course, I'm a uh, ex jock. You know, I think of it like as, as, a, as a wrestling tournament. You know, there's uh, people in Pennsylvania that are good and people in New York that are good. But now you get to California and you the best meet the best. And that's right. that's what that's what uh, your model is. That's right. I mean, can you imagine if you were, a, you know, a Dallas Cowboy, if you only recruited from Dallas schools only, what would happen? Like, there's all this amazing talent. So think about when time comes and we're taking first round picks, right? <laughs> you're, you're not necessarily picking kids that are just from your local town or even right. your state. You're going to say, hey, I want the best of the best. They might be somewhere across the country. Can you romance them enough to bring them over to your team, knowing that they're going to be in your state, you know, playing and representing? So okay. it's, it applies. It applies pretty much across the board. And you were doing this 20 years ago before, before it's like everyone, you know, was forced into learning how to do it. But you were doing this 20 years yeah. ago? Yeah, before it was cool. That's why when COVID hit, I kind of laughed and I was like, well, I'm actually really used to working from home. So this I've been is doing not, this. Yeah. <laughs> my commute is still, you know, 10 steps outside my door. No problem. <laughs> so cool. Guys, I'm speaking with Mary D. Uh, she is the, uh, the founder at the Mad Love Agency. You guys can get more information if you go to MaryD.com. That's D-E-E, -E, Mary, D-E-E.com. All right, uh, Mary, let's, let's, uh, let's get uh, these people uh, uh, attended to. Diane, Melbourne, uh, how can I heal or treat my unconscious mind? Mm, I don't know, Diane. Question. I don't know. I, great uh, question. I just read, I just read them. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Diane's asking a really good question. So Diane, number one, that tells me that you're already super aware. You're super aware that you have some stuff going on in your mind that isn't necessarily a list of things that you know or are super aware of that you need to work on. And so that's, that's sort of a, a, a roundabout confusing sentence. And I'm going to break that down for everyone in layman's terms. So you, you can all join in and understand what we're talking about. So there are things called attachment styles. And I'm going to take you back. Okay. So That's for example, fun. example, like my mom was super nurturing and she always was like putting her hands on me. I was a baby that was swaddled and held and just really loved. And so it created for me in my early years, a sense of security. 
right? So I feel secure. Unfortunately, there are times where babies are born and their, the mother might be going through her own uh, postpartum depression, or she might um, have, you know, passed away during childbirth. And so this, you get this baby who is now, of course, goes to a nurse who puts them in a, a little, you know, crib and, and puts a little blanket on them and they get held periodically, but you're now dealing with lots of babies in the nursery. And now oh, this baby is going to have to go be adopted or this baby has to be held by someone else in the household if the mom is really struggling. So you have a child who is not overly held and nurtured and they may not feel that same sense of security. And although I'm giving you that physical example of security in our early years, when we are developing, that is actually a time where we should be held and swaddled because that security physically actually does create security for us emotionally. So this is where a lot of disconnects happen. And some people are walking around in the world realizing that maybe their childhood wasn't that nurturing place that gives them that sense of security inside. And this is often where you see some of the lack of confidence or you see just some of the pain people may carry around, you know, being held or even being close to people or, or trusting. And so you have these different things that become unconscious because you don't realize that that's what happened. Most of us don't remember what we were doing as a one-year-old, right? right? Or yeah, yeah. coming out of the, coming out of the tunnel uh, into this world. <laughs> <laughs> I got you, Mary. <laughs> yeah, so it's, the, it's recognizing that. And so that's the first step is we have to realize like sometimes there are these things that are our mind remembers and that are, are stuffed back there in the corners because also the pain, painful things our body likes to try, our mind likes to help us remove, right? Our bodies, our brain is here to keep us from, from pain. And it, that's oh. why it gives us signals if there's something that feels not good. Is that that inner, that, that, that uh, the, the uh, thing you feel in your gut kind of, is that kind of what you're for talking sure, about? For sure, for okay. sure. And that's why you see people with different like, levels of anxiety, right? Why mm -hmm. can one person hop on a roller coaster and go, no problem, I got this. <laughs> and the other person is like totally freaked out. They're like, I cannot imagine doing that in a hundred years because what if I fall out? Right. right. So they have all this conversation happening in their mind. What if I fall out? What if it, what if it goes too fast? What if it comes off the rails? Whereas you have this other person who's like, I'm going to feel re really secure in this. And like, no, I'm going to go for it because I've ridden a roller coaster before. And I know that every time I get on, I'm safe. And so I'm going to take, you know, a calculated level of risk. Right. For the most part, I feel confident that that roller coaster is going to have fun. It's going to do what it needs to do. And I'm going to get off that ride. Right. And this is where you just have the ways of thinking. We all think differently. So how do we get in there and say, what beliefs do I hold right now? Whether I was taught them, whether I decided on them myself, um, how do I take those things I believe are absolute? Like, for example, if I think getting on a roller coaster is going to kill me, how do I say, is that a limiting belief? Because, and you can ask yourself a few questions, like, do other people get on roller coasters and live? Yes. Do I know people who have gotten on roller coasters and died? I don't know anyone personally. I know it's happened. It can happen. It's certainly a possibility. But now I have to weigh that risk out and say, well, what's, what's really like for me, what do I think that's going to lead to? And we, we have to make some decisions around that. And so this is where we start to ask ourselves really good questions about what we are believing so we can challenge them a little bit and figure out if those beliefs are actually limiting us to move to the next phase or to move on to things that could be bigger and better and greater. Wow, so thought out, what, what a great answer. Thank you for that. Um, that was, that's pretty impressive. Hey, uh, Diane, I think uh, uh, for you to write that question and, and to get that response, I think that's a home run right there. Uh, Mr. Producer, did you just say you had one? Uh, you got a new one coming in, so we'll trade off? Yes, um, I did have another question. We have Brad from LA. He asks, um, as a leader, is pride important? Ooh. Oh, is pride important? So I love the word pride because I think that we all have to define for ourselves what pride means, right? There's the negative connotation of pride of like, oh, that guy's so prideful, right? Like he's super boastful. He puts himself on a pedestal and everyone else is, you know, second best. He's, right. the, he's the one. He's got all this pride. And then you have pride of 
when I think of, for example, like a parent, they're watching their child win an award or right. score a touchdown. They're like, well, there's a lot of pride. Cause like, that's my kid. Right. My kid is winning in the world. That's pretty cool. And, yeah. And I love, I love the pride of being able to look at someone and go, wow, they're doing something amazing in the world. Wow. This is really going well. Wow. They're, they're winning. Yes. Like more people should win in the world. Mm -hmm. So there's these different levels of pride. So I think it depends on your definition of pride. Number one. And the second part is I believe that there's a level of confidence. And so if we want to call that a level of pride, I'm good with that. Let's we can <laughs> use that as the language that we want to talk about here okay. today. But yeah, I think there is certainly a level of confidence because to lead, we have to be willing to step up and say, I'm willing to be seen and heard with the understanding that sometimes I actually may be wrong. So my sense of responsibility is actually quite large because people are listening to me and they're watching me and they are taking what I say, probably with a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, it's got a, a big weight to it. Yeah. And so when we know that, this is why as leaders, I say we should also be able to look at that level of confidence. And sometimes our pride has to take a back seat to certain things. Uh, I'm a firm believer in raising up the team, right? Because we never get where we are by ourselves. Right. We don't. We, we just don't. People think they do, but you don't. You didn't do it alone. You didn't do it completely alone. Some way, somehow someone helped you. And if you say, oh, well, I have a great Instagram account and I have tons of followers and I did that myself because I did every post. You did, but people had to show up and follow you and, and engage with you. Yeah. So you can thank those people for being the people who helped you with that rise. And so that's, there's, we never do it alone, Casey. Yeah, we great, never great do it point. alone. I, I, that is a great point. And it, I think it's, it's about being aware too. Mm. Uh, and uh, guys, if, uh, if you're listening to Mary D right now, uh, you see why she's so successful and, and uh, so good at what she does. Um, go to Mary um, You want to talk about leadership. You want to, you want to improve your, your company or whatever you're going through. Mary D come in and Mary, what, what's it, what's it like when, when you get that first call, um, do you do you do a uh, like a consultation first just to try and see what this company or this person's about and then how does it go from there take me through the, the process of it if you don't mind sure. sure yeah i don't mind at all so typically it's either going to come by referral or they're going to come through my website they're going to fill out a little bit of a form because i want to know about their business i want to know why they're doing their business I want to know what they think their pain points are. Uh, and then through our conversation, I have a small framework that I take them through where I ask a lot of really good questions mm -hmm. so we can actually get down to what's going on in the organization and where, where the help actually needs to happen. Sometimes it's in the bigger thing, like their overall strategy. Sometimes it's with the actual CEO and their leadership team. Like I actually want to know what kind of, what kind of leader are you? And I have these, five different kinds of leaders that I go through and I describe each one. And I actually use a little bit of a sports analogy through them, but there there's five types of leaders that I have come to find over the time that I've been doing this work. And within these five types of leaders, they actually all require a slightly different kind of team to support them. And that's really important because too many times we look back at some of these old school frameworks, like you'll see an org chart and usually it's like the CEOs at the top and then there's mm -hmm. a COO and then there's a, yeah, then there's the VPs and then it just kind of goes from there. And it's like, okay, like, yeah, it's a very cookie cutter thing. And I'm like, I'm so sorry, but like, that's not going to work for everyone. <laughs> and that's why you have CEOs that are really struggling and they, they might feel insufficient. They're like, man, I know I'm really talented and I'm great at, let's say sales, but for some reason, I just don't have this thing where I want to manage all these people and I don't know how, and it doesn't feel good for me. Like my genius is in selling and in knowing my vision and where I want to take this business. Okay, great. If that's the case, no problem. This is where we want to hire people who can super support this CEO that's great at sales and let him be amazing at that piece of the business and let him really shine where he can shine. But in the minutia of some of the management pieces, this is where you bring in leaders who are great at managing that may not be great at sales and they support him and surround him. And that's how you balance out an organization to make it 
great across the board because everyone is leveraging their strengths mm -hmm. versus constantly beating themselves up over, oh man, I'm just not great at this one thing that I'm supposed to be doing in this role. It's like, well, who said you were supposed to be doing that in that role? Why don't we make this actually work for the vision? We create teams around a vision. We don't necessarily create them because of this, you know, cookie cutter. Or right. right. It, it's, it's so great. I mean, fast. you can tell how great you are about thinking outside the box and bringing in uh, different techniques and, and uh, different details. Mary D, you are uh, an incredible guest. Uh, I love hearing uh, your ideas and uh, how, how your mind works. And I see, I see why you're in such demand. Guys, go to Mary D, D E E uh, dot com. Mary, um, I want to know about the more of those uh, those types that you were talking about before and, and the, the other um, sports analogies. I want to know more about that. But uh, we, we uh, ran out of time. But I do want to give you uh, the last word. Anything you want the audience to think about or to ponder or uh, uh, reflect on uh, until I speak to you again, as my grandmother used to say, Mary D, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. You know, as we are kicking off this Just Eat the Cake podcast, what I actually want to know from people is, what do you wish you had known when you were 20 that you know now, right? Or the other way I'll frame it is, what do you know now that you wish you had known when you were 20 before you went out into the world and had work and relationships and careers and issues <laughs> and success, like share all the things. Like those are the questions I actually want people to write in and call in and ask us so that we can talk about them because there is a beautiful way we can round that out and bring this home in terms of rounding out life. Because again, I want people to love their work, but I also want them to build amazing cultures in their business. And we do that by answering some of these questions uh, because our life is holistic. We're all emotions and spirit and finance and relationships and those all come together to make us really who we are and how we feel we're not just this one thing so yeah. how do we answer that question for the world and and i want to hear from everyone else their answers on that so that we can bring them a lot of value mary you're you're, you're so, such a great guest i mean i can ask you so many things that's why we didn't even get to a lot of the things that we were supposed to get to but we will next time uh, guys, Mary D, go to MaryD.com. Mary, you're an uh, awesome guest. Thank you so much. And, and I'm sorry I, if I didn't get that. I still have it printed out, so I will get to you next time. Uh, but uh, for Mary D, um, Casey, I'll be right back. Thank you. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day -day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's, it's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage-free, fully adaptive, handicap-accessible house, and there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit hfotusa.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's going to be okay.